Hi, I'm Wayne Howe from Weston Hills Access Television, and welcome to What's in the Neighborhood. I'm here at the Woodstock Historical Society Museum in the village of Bryant Pond, Maine. Now let's go in and take a look around. Hi, you're looking at the, uh, the old Bryant Pond switchboard, uh, which kind of made uh, town of Woodstock famous because we were the last town in the, the country that had a hand crank phone system. And that's why we have kind of a, a statue of one out on the, uh, the common out uh, by the post office. So let's come down and see what else is here. Of course, we have a lot of displays and different uh, you know, pictures and artifacts, things for Woodstock High School. The old Woodstock High School banner that I can re remember when I was going to the high school. And we have some swords from the Knights of Pythias organization that was uh, uh, once in town. And beside that, we have a new display of the uh, Franklin Grange. Unfortunately, the Franklin Grange uh, uh, became defunct this year, 2018. So we did to receive some of the the pictures and some of the, and a lot of the paperwork of the history of the uh, the Grange itself, and there is a booklet here, which shows most of the Grange masters over the years, including my grandfather J. Everett Howe. How did how did that happen? Okay, now we're looking at the uh, the railroad display here at the. Uh, Woodstock Historical Society Museum. Uh, we have some new, um, I guess, materials on display now that were not before. If you look up at the top, you can see the clock, which used to be out in front of the museum. That is the clock from the Bryant Pond train station. And un under that is the actual sign that was on the station. It said Bryant's Pond. Sometimes they put an S on it, sometimes they just called it Bryant Pond. It made a difference, I guess, what they wanted to, to call it at the time. And there are some pictures uh, of some of the uh, trains that have gone through in the past, uh, along with uh, some pictures from the derailment in 1984, which was a major event in town and could have been catastrophic if uh, the tanks uh, that had been full of uh, like natural gas or whatever had been uh, ruptured, but luckily they were not. So it just happened to be a, a big mess for the railroad. Uh, we also have like the original cash box from Rufus Dunham, the, who was the station manager, the first station manager, and had that job for many, many years. And this is uh, the Woodstock Fire Department display. We had it upstairs uh, at one time, but since our we had the, the water problems and the roof had to be replaced. We decided to move this downstairs into a more prominent location. We have some of the historic uh, helmets right up through current day helmets. And the same with the, uh, the boots. We have current boots and we have the vintage boots. Bunker jackets, which are currently worn by the fire department. We have on the top display here, we have an old uh, fire department uh, jacket. And beside it, we have the newer kind, which is current apparel. So there's quite a difference uh, in the history of the fire department. We have some pictures of the first, what I'll call it a fire wagon that uh, Woodstock had. It, it is currently at one of the town garages and we have had it here uh, on occasion on display. It is uh, quite a magnificent uh, 
old machine, really. One reason we moved the display downstairs is so we could go with this piece of equipment right here. This is uh, the Hale fire pump that was first mounted on a 1927 Rio truck in the town of Woodstock. And as you can probably tell but just by what, looking at it, it is extremely heavy and it was not going to go upstairs for our display. So it was easy to bring the display downstairs to the pump. Another new display we have this year are a series of uh, pictures taken from glass negatives that we receive from uh, our cat estate and the Crockett estate. Over the winter, volunteers used a computer scanner to turn these glass plates into prints that could be shown to the public. One of the pictures I like uh, the most is that it shows the building of the Woodstock High School building. And you can actually see people working on it on some of the scaffolding. The plates were in boxes, uh, quite similar to that. And they were around the 1915 era because that picture right there is a baseball game that was played during Woodstock's by, uh, centennial, which was in 1915. And the church was decorated uh, in the parsonage for the 1915 celebration. And that building is still in town. It's uh, the old town office now. Well, it used to be a town office when I was a kid. And this is a view from Lake Christopher taken up from the top of Mount Christopher. And our first switchboard in town. Not too many lines at that time. Hi, I'm Jewel Clark and I'm with Western Hills Access Television. Uh, Wayne Howe and I are at the Woodstock Historical Society today and we, we actually, I came in here a couple years ago, three years ago, and it was my first trip into this museum and we, I, ever since that time we thought we should do a show from here. So that's what we're doing today to introduce you to the museum and this is What's in the Neighborhood. And today we have Paul Billings. Mm -hmm and Larry Bonney, and we're going to talk about the Historical Society Museum. So, would you like to give us a little brief, like when did the Historical Society originate? The Historical Society started the origination in 1975. It didn't get incorporated till 79, because at that time they started putting the charter together Mm -hmm. the Constitution, and as you know, it takes several years to get it through state red tape to get it incorporated. Uh, this building we are sitting at, we received a deed in November of 79, was 78. it? 78. from Annie Crockett. Wow. And Annie Crockett was a very prominent person in town. Her husband was the post uh, rail mass, railroad master mm -hmm. here in town. And she was a school teacher for many years, over 20 years in town. Wow. And they owned this building, and Robert Crockett kept antique cars in here. And after he died, and he was very prominent with the historical society and said, I will donate this building to you if you will build us a gr me a garage at my house. <laughs> so the men of the society got together, and they built a garage at her house, and she, in turn, deeded this building over to the historical site. That's a very interesting story. Now, is that is that her over on the wall where they have the the plates, the the um, the like negatives, the pictures over on the wall? Is that any? It, it, it said it, Annie Crockett over there. Right it there. may be. Uh, we have a picture of Robert Crockett when he was young here, mm -hmm. in one of the big photos on the wall here. Okay. And uh, Annie could very easily. We've got some photos of her. Are these, any of these her clothes? They could be very I easy. like her style. Mm -hmm. Cool. So how long have you been here since the origin of the society, even when in its planning stages? I was not a charter member, no. Uh, my brother was, Larry, and he was curator here for 39 years. And my mother was one of the original charter members, along with my father, Robert Billings. And when did you come on board? 
I came on board probably 76, 77. I wasn't the original member that started the charter mm -hmm. or the bylaws. But you've been an important member ever mm -hmm. since. Well, important. He's been treasurer so. for I don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. an important member. Mm -hmm. And when did you get involved? I was a latecomer. I was. I really didn't get involved in well, ninety eight. Uh huh. And well, that's been quite a while, though. Well, so yeah, but it was, and then for a lot of years, I didn't, I wasn't around to come to the society. I was working out of town and things. So it's really been the last, what, ten to fifteen years mm -hmm. that I've been around a lot. So. Mm -hmm. And Elsie is involved yep. as well, right? Yep. Well, the first time I came in, she was dressed in the, the uh, clothing of mm -hmm. the era, yes. two hundred years ago. So yes. that was, I was, I was very impressed. I like. I like things like this. <laughs> so, um, so you've both been involved in your in active. Do you each like what do you call it? Host in here? Yes. Yeah. On yeah. the on the weekends. Yeah. Is that yeah. the only? Is it open just on the weekends? Just on the weekends now. And they can also contact the town office, and Vern Maxfield will contact one of the people of the society if they'd like to come in. Sometime they'd make arrangements to come in. Yeah, we are open by appointment. Mm -hmm. so. Do schools ever come? Yes, we've had the conservation school people come mm -hmm. on occasion, and we've had school children come, and mm -hmm. they have a tour, and and we teach them what we know and what we can teach them. One of the biggest resources we have in the society is Ruby Emery's history. She's written several, several volumes of books of the history of the town, history of the cemeteries, history of, you name it, you probably name it, she's, she's written, written it. it. You know, she's no longer here. I was going to say, is this someone that has passed? Yes. And, and when was her era of writing? Um, mid seventies, eighties, eighties. Yeah, she, she passed away in what? Yeah, late nineties. Late nineties. We have a uh, fireproof safe with all her volumes in it. Oh, okay, yeah. that's. And a lot of it is research material because when we have a question, we'll go to it and we'll pull out the volume to, to cemeteries, or we'll pull out the volume to houses in town, mm -hmm. and we can know what house was built, when, where, and who owned it, and who owned it over the time period. Ruby Emery. Hmm. Now, what was her husband's name? Well, I don't. Walter. I don't know her husband's name because oh. <laughs> he passed way before my time. Well, I was looking around in here before, and I saw, but it might not have been Emery. There was a cup over there donated mm -hmm. by someone, and mm -hmm. there was a picture of. It looked like her husband. Well, they had the same name, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that was. I don't. Hmm. Was I'm not really sure. Right? I almost think her husband's name was Walter, but I'm not positive. Could have been. My wife could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is your favorite thing that happens at this museum? When people come or when you receive new things to put on display or organizing what you already have? I like talking to people. Yeah. And people come in here and tell me stories that I have not heard before of the town, of the area. They'll come in and say, I remember way back when, when McKillop's store was on the corner and we went in there and we get penny candy from a barrel. <laughs> uh, we, he, he'd go out back and we don't, we, we had brought in our milk jug and he'd pour the milk into the jug for us. Aww. You know, and things like that. And a lot of nice memories of the town. Now I saw things about McKillop's store. When did, what period of time was that in like it's I would say in the 50s because yeah. he had the store, it was actually on the corner where the hotel, where the main house is, main house is oh, now. Okay. It was, the, yeah, it was, was right it was there. between the main house and, and Walker's, yeah. where Walker's live now. There was a building there and that was, that was the store mm -hmm. and yep. they tore that down in 1970, I believe. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, it, it's ended in the mid '60s, yeah. and then and they tore eventually it tore it down in the '70s, in the 70s. Yeah. early '70s. It was like 1970, 71. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the uh, the store because I played little league back at the time. I would have been what 1962, mm -hmm. been like 10 yeah. years old or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you'd ride your bicycle up to the store and leave your bicycle there unchained, yeah. and that's where you would get your ride with the coach or one of the other parents to go to your game. You come back, your bike will still be there, and then you'd uh, ride home. 
-hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. after dark. Mm -hmm. But that's that was at the McKillop's store, who yeah. then yeah. later became McGinnis's store. McGinnis's yeah. store, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, as he's saying that, I'm thinking of the term, the phrase back in the day. Mm. And I think of that phrase, and I wonder if in the future, if young people now will be using that phrase back in the day, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, know if that will disappear. I, don't, I, don't know. I, I think they will. I mean, I hope so. When we were young, we didn't think of it as back in the day either. But I never heard that phrase either. And I no, love. I did. You did? I did from my grandmother. Yeah. You and, love and, and I love the old time when I see kids nowadays come in here and look at the old switchboard and say, that was a phone? <laughs> This is my phone, electronic <laughs> phone. My granddaughter came up from Massachusetts one time, and we at our house had one of the old rotary phones mm -hmm. that you picked up and you dialed, and we had to teach her how to actually dial the phone by rotary because she never saw a rotary phone. She's, what, 10 years, 13 years old now, mm -hmm. and she had to learn how to dial the rotary phone, and she actually had to make a phone call to her mother in Massachusetts <laughs> because she had to use that phone to make the phone call. I was, she and probably she liked said, it. And she said, this is a lot of work to make a phone call, not this beep-in business. We had, we had the fifth grade class in here, what, a couple of years ago. Yeah. We have an old typewriter over on the, and they yeah. had no idea what that was. Oh, yeah. yeah. No idea at all what a typewriter was. I think we're very lucky hmm. to have lived in the time period we have yes. because so, so much took place in that time mm -hmm. period. And I've asked questions to like people in their late 80s. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's even more mind-boggling mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so we're lucky. Luck Very on. lucky. <laughs> Very lucky. So what's your favorite part of it, Larry? Oh, uh, I, like, I like the people coming in. I also, I like the exhibits coming in. So things we can change in the exhibits because it keeps people interested so they will come back again. Well, that's what I'm wondering where, I mean, I kind of have ideas where you might acquire things, but where do you acquire things? Is it through people knowing? Like you? the Grange. This, this whole okay. exhibit right behind us is a new exhibit. The Grange just folded in Woodstock. Mm -hmm. So they gave so us they gave they us all of the material that's in that corner for the Grange. And we still have, we have more material for the Grange that we don't have that out. We haven't got out yet. We have all of their record books from back to 1875, when the wow. Grange started. And wow. every meeting every they have meeting, recorded. They've recorded every meeting. It's all handwritten. It's and not on a floppy disk or not computer. On a floppy no. disk. It's not on a it's, it's, it's not on a chip that you put in your computer. It's I, all handwritten. I have been to some Grange meetings down here because mm -hmm. I've gone down to sing. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by the whole process mm -hmm. and and the handwriting. And bless Bertha Ha's soul. Mm -hmm. She I have seen stuff she's written. Mm -hmm. All of these things out. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed that mm -hmm. part of her hands are missing. Mm -hmm. And she did a beautiful handwriting. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And I watched Richard Felt and mm -hmm. doing all, and they're oh, yeah. all so sweet. Mm -hmm. Now, did that Grange close completely? Or did yeah. those members join in with another some of, Grange? Some of the members, Paul, Paul actually is actually, a member. Actually, we, we joined in with East Bethel. Okay. So our Grange merged into East Bethel because there was no longer enough members to warrant this Grange to financial solvency. Mm -hmm. So they've merged into East Bethel and hope that enough Granges merge together, they can keep a few left going. Do you know how many there are in Maine? I, I don't know how many Granges there are in Maine. You'd have to, Maine State Grange could answer that because they have those records. We'll have to do a show on the Grange. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you over at the Grange. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's one place, but they, they, things must come from personal estate oh, yes. as well. We just had a gentleman bring in a whole bunch of pictures today. Uh huh. We haven't had a chance to look at them. We don't know what they are yet, but he brought in a whole bunch of pictures. We've had uh, tons of pictures donated, and we're trying to get them all put on on computers so that people can come in and they want to look at something, we can show them mm -hmm. what, how, where it is. And the we digital all, age. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's beyond me. I'm, uh, I don't do digitally. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have this. Yes. So yes. you don't, but, but you kind of have to go there to okay. keep up with and the We world. have members who are doing it on our yeah, computer. on our computer. computer. Mm -hmm. so. And 
keeping records and trying to assess the thing being it is that in the future that's going to be the way everything is. Mm -hmm. right. People yeah. are going to come in and they're going to want to look at something. It's easier for them to look at it on a computer than it is to go dig out a photograph and say, well, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what it was. Mm -hmm. And especially yeah. the kids today, because the kids today, anything to do with a computer, they can do in mm -hmm. a third of the time that the rest right. of us can And they do want anything. to know like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. yeah. They know how to do that, too. <laughs> now, I see... Uh, a lot of I see sports things over here. Was, now, were those acquired from the school? Yes, the, some were. Some, some were actually from some of the players in the in the uh, town team league, uh -huh. which is I don't even know if it even has a town team league anymore. No. No. But uh, and some of them were from the high school some here into the high school. Right, that's what I wondered if they yeah. were. Trophies but from the, the town of Woodstock had a baseball team from I don't know way back. Right. I mean. We just acquired a picture the other day from, from a, a lady that gets a 1937 picture of a baseball team that was uh -huh. down in Woodstock. I think one of the photographs we saw over there was of a baseball yep. game. Could be. And then yeah. I saw a nice picture of a team right yeah. over here. One of the best players in the town was Stan Farah. Stan Farah? Yep. Yeah. And Stan was a minor league ball player for many years. Uh -huh. And he pitched in the Pine Tree League here. And he was probably the best pitcher in the Pine Tree League for this area in the state of Maine. And do you remember that time frame? I saw him pitch a couple times, and you did too, didn't you? <laughs> I, I saw him yeah. quite a few times. Yeah. And he was a wonderful pitcher. Even in his 40s and 50s, yep. he could pitch. Oh, wow. And a lot of the poor players he locally was, He was postmaster here in town for I don't know how many years. Wow. And yeah. That's the type of history we like. You know, things people can relate to. Now, um, I heard mention of, of a, a man that I know, a younger man, and um, he's up at the Bethel Historical Society. And what, do you, do you have a lot of younger members? No. Well, we uh, have a few. We have a few. Uh -huh. not, a, not a lot. Uh -huh. But a lot of, I've discovered that a lot of people don't get interested into history, particularly until they start, how do I word this, feeling their mortality? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know? that would make sense. And then when they start feeling their mortality and say, why am I keeping this stuff? Because I'm not going to be here forever, mm -hmm. but I want to preserve mm -hmm. forever. Right. This is where people like come to the historical society or come to organizations and say, can you help me preserve this? That's why the Grange did this. That's why this gentleman just came in with pictures. My family doesn't care about them. My relatives don't care about them, right. but I want these preserved because they're important to me. And they're people I know, my mother, my grandmother, my father, mother. And they might know. be important to other people that yes. they don't even know. That they don't even well, know. Because if you're into history, which we are, obviously, yeah. uh, we like to go back and look, and, and uh, particularly myself, I like to go back and look at the pictures of, of my grandparents and their parents, mm -hmm. and it helps when you try to figure out where you came from. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought I wanted to make a little book for my. I thought it for my two youngest grandchildren. One's eight mm. months and one's mm. three, and then they they go older and older. One's mm. twenty one. One's mm -hmm. fourteen. But I th I thought the little ones. I said, Grammy and Grampy were young once too, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. because yeah. they would only know right. us as yeah. older people. Right. Yeah. Right. And so it, I think the photographs are, yeah. are mm. important. Very much so. And that's why some organizations, and I'd like to see us maybe do it, they try to record like World War II vets mm -hmm. or Korean vets. Get the hit, and not just World War II and Korean, but people as they get older, the memories that they have. Get them on tape, get them photographed like this even. I've heard, I've heard around the community, the Bethel community, that... Uh, idea many times over the years. Hmm. I don't know if many people have done it. Wayne and I did a, an older gentleman up in Moscow, Maine, hmm. uh, about three years ago, and hmm. heard a lot of great compliments on that, hmm. that interview. Hmm. He was a trapper and he was a veteran. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he, he had photographs of, of the war, and, hmm. I mean, his time in the service. Hmm. So, what do you think, what seems to be the most popular exhibit? With the with the people coming in the school, well what? the school yeah, the school, school and the really? old switchboard. Yeah. Oh, the switch. Yeah, I the, wondered the about switchboard the switchboard in the school. Yeah, because we have a lot of the uh, Eurekas from Woodstock High School. Uh huh. We have them 
almost a complete set. I think we're missing like six volumes back in the 1920s. So those are the... The yearbooks. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So people are really Those would be fun to look yeah. at. I you know, know people. We actually, we actually have a scrapbook here that goes back to 1918 mm. of graduating classes of Woodstock no, High School. Woodstock High School. Wow. Wow. We don't. Have, some of the pictures we've got lost over the years, but most of them we have all the all the graduates. Oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's that, and then the, the phone. System, phone, yep. Of course, yeah. which. And we have new people that are coming into town, buying a new house mm -hmm. or an old new house, and they come here and say, "We'd like to know the history of a house." Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And who owned it before? Well, I pictures. Of I've met some younger people that, like, I subbed a lot in the school system. And a couple of years ago, well, probably three or four now, there were some boys in high school that wished that that could be a course, that local history mm. was mm -hmm. local, not like just, not like, not like even main history, but local mm. history. They would have been very interested mm -hmm. in it. And I noticed one society I read in the paper the other day that started a history club for kids from eight to 15 years old. Oh, wow. Where was that? I think over in Minot. Really? I, saw it, yeah. I, had, I didn't happen to see Minot. that. That, that sounds like a wonderful idea, actually. Yeah. It, it yeah. does, if, if you could get them away from the electronic yes. devices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's such a double-edged sword. Mm. I don't want to put them down, but it's yeah. just... But so at the so same much. time, they could come here and help us mm. do yes. our computer. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's a great idea. Yeah. And let them learn history too at the same time. Paul's uh -huh. mother was a school teacher here in town for years, mm -hmm. and she did that kind mm -hmm. of thing for several yes. years. She had the kids all write down about their own houses. Mm -hmm. And we have a slideshow here somewhere, and we're going to get it out because I don't remember where it is. Wayne knows where it is, I'm sure, that we need to get that out and go through that again so that people can see where the houses were because mm -hmm. a lot of the houses are gone. Right, right. I mean, Main Street doesn't look like anything like it was no. even when I was a kid. No, I, <laughs> so I've it's... looked at enough old pictures mm -hmm. around to mm -hmm. go, like, whoa. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe we can stop this little talk right here mm -hmm. and go around and specifically look at some things. Oh, sure, and okay. I can ask you about those. Hi, Joel. Hi, Wayne. <laughs> this is fun to be in front of the camera with you. Oh, I don't know about that. Mr. But, uh, Invisible is the cameraman right now. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, Wayne, you're the president of this historical society, is that correct? Currently, I am. Hopefully, uh, hoping to be replaced in a couple months. I've been president for, it'll be two years. Okay. So, that's, that's long enough to... Uh, for anybody to have it and time to let someone else take over. Now, will be, there be like campaigns and people in primaries? <laughs> How does ba that bas work? Basically, the campaign is if you can find someone that doesn't say no, okay. then, they, then they win. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. <laughs> but but you know, the thing is, I, see, I'm a, a young member. I only joined in 2013. So when you were talking to Larry and, uh, and Paul, I mean, they've been members a lot longer than I have. And it took no time at all for me to become vice president and then president of the society. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hadn't learned how to say no yet. So anyone joining the society might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> if you want to move up politically, you can become president. Uh, just let everybody know you're interested. I forgot to ask them how many members are in the society. Or, I mean, I don't know if they have to be a member. How many people help with the society I'm, this is just well I'm going to guess that they may we may have up to like around a hundred actual members Wow! Uh, but the ones that actually uh, work at the society or volunteer to, to come in during weekends uh, especially Saturdays when we're open or to uh, work on the cleanup that number is more like uh, probably 18 or you know 12 okay. to 18 at any one given time so it's, it, there's a difference between those that support us by being a member mm -hmm. and those that are more active. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you you asked the other members like what they liked best about the yeah, historical that's what society. I was just wondering what you liked. And best. well, that's why I said I've got to get out in front too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I like meeting the people. I like seeing the pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, the old pictures, especially of the buildings and the town. Uh, not so much about the people that I don't know, but uh, physically how the town has changed o over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it's a teacher in me or not, but I also like to do programs. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, like I did a program on the railroads. Uh, um, you mean it, was this a, was it a program that you did for members of the society? And or anyone and anyone for, else that wanted to, to come and, like, and see it. Like it was a special presentation. Yeah, it was a, yes. It, here. Yes. At, in the evening or something or on a yeah during weekend. a meeting a meeting day we uh -huh. had a, a program uh, back during the. Uh, um, the bicentennial back in 2015, uh, I was uh, Ezra Stevens, you know, dressed up as Ezra Stevens, who was the famous uh, circus master that lived in the I town remember, of Bryant Pond. Because you looked very yeah. dapper, kind of reminded me of like a mon the Monopoly guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And we did. Uh, we had kind of a ghost walk one one time for the. Uh, Members of uh, MOCA, which is a cemetery group that we hosted, uh, they mm -hmm. had a, a big meeting. I think I've and, read about that in the paper. Yeah, and so I was, well, I was him. I, I, you know, I talked that I was him at the cemetery, and and then Will uh, Chapman was also uh, Sidney Parham, the the former governor that was from the town of Woodstock. And I like doing stuff. I like dressing up and doing things like that. Now I would think, just my little simple brain. That that kind of presentation in a curriculum, in a school program, would be very powerful. I think it would be. Because when, when, when I used to substitute, I mean, I've thought, if you wanted to entertain the kids every day, you'd be like teacher of the year, but that's a lot of work. But to Absolutely. do that sometimes, that would be so yeah. you're, impressive. You're, you're bringing history down to a personal level. Yes. And that's that's one of the things that I, I enjoy making a, a fool of myself. I can get out of my, my myself and and, uh -huh. and do that. Uh -huh. And I think it's probably the, the thirty something years of teaching that got me used to being in front of people yeah, that uh, I never would have done before. You have to be teaching. A you perform. Yes, yeah, whether, absolutely. Whether you think you do or not. So but. anyone at the school board or any administration, <laughs> I am for programs <laughs> like that in school. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, actually, the fifth grade when they do. Um, they take on a character. I can't remember what it's called, the Wax Museum. I have been to a couple of those, and well, more than that, and each one of them take on a character, so it helps them learn. But the whole thing at a cemetery, coming up from behind a grave. <laughs> well, I didn't say we came up from behind but it, but. You could. <laughs> <laughs> you could. That would be very but, uh, impressive. It's, and, you know, you'd you know, get the researching of the, of the person, and you try to bring that person uh, to, to life. Yeah. You know, for the for the uh, folks that are are interested in uh, a little piece of history. Yes. So. So do you come in? You come in here sometimes on Saturdays. You were here last week. Right. The, I, I was here with uh, with Jen Chase, one of our other members, uh, when we op we opened it up for the first uh, for the first time this year. Uh, we were delayed in opening because we had to have the new roof. Uh, the museum was in some disarray because of the. Uh, Water damage and just having to move everything around to to allow the uh, or to clean up the, the mess and the dust after the new roof was put back on. So currently we do not have any displays upstairs, but we do have new displays downstairs uh, here. And we're open right now every weekend until the end of August. And I, I would also say by appointment also, if you really want to come in and you're not available, come in during. Uh, our time from two to five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, call up, uh, go to our Facebook page, uh, and just uh, ask if there's a way that uh, the museum can be opened up for your group or yourself or whatever. We can usually find a, a time. We're quite obliging that way. So, yeah, I just thought of like four things. <laughs> so you have a a Facebook page that serves as like a web page. Yes. It? Okay. Yes. Is there a reason you don't stay open in the fall through like the fall foliage? I would think there would be a lot of traffic. Well, we found out that there may be a lot of traffic, but we don't get that many people stopping in. It's when we had uh, the museum museum open during the uh, the bicentennial year. Mm -hmm. We had a banner year of people visiting because everybody That's when was I came. in. <laughs> yeah, everyone was interested in the town and the history because it was 200 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, the next year we were 201 years old, and <laughs> and we didn't get very many people at all. Yeah, we're hoping to get more. We now have a sign out front that uh, tells people when 
the museum is open like the next weekend or, mm -hmm. or whatever, so that we're trying to get more word out there. I wonder if having something like, I don't know how you do it, but specifying something like the, the crank phone display or something like that. Catches that would probably that. help, and that, that's one of the ideas also, like if we had some sort of a presentation we were doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if we had a food sale, mm -hmm. then that's good to have that because we do get people stopping in and for the food sale. We had a big, au not auction, but, but a big uh, yard sale this spring to help pay for the, uh, the roof. And that was quite a, quite a success you know, financially for us. Now, that's it. This is, now this is my other questions I was going to ask them too. When you change displays, you get more things and you have to move other things. Where do you store what you're not displaying? Uh, it quite often it would be upstairs. Okay. Uh, where the upstairs is, you know, we're under the eaves, so that there is some room back under the eaves where you would prominently be able to see, you know, uh, artifacts and things. We kind of can tuck them back behind current displays. There's no basement here. There is a basement, but it's. Uh, How silly it's, of me it's, to assume it's, that it was. It's only f used for large items that are not of any great value. Okay. Uh, and you know, it's where the furnace is, so I mean, that, okay. that's good for that. But it's it's not a dry place to uh, actually be a good storage now, place. Does the historical society own the church? Yes, we do. So, is anything stored there? Or when when you talked about the yard sale, like last month I think it was in my mind I was visualizing it being at the church but it was probably right here. it was right here off yeah. the main main road because of the traffic we could get so what happens with the church as far as this to be involved with it well it's a little bit in limbo at the time or at this time because we don't have a lot of members that are active so it would take more people to probably actively get it you know open um, we basically bought the church for a dollar from mm -hmm. the Universalist uh, Unitarian uh, organization. And I'm going to guess it was probably like three or four years ago now. Uh, don't, I, I may not be wrong on that, but, uh, <laughs> but we, we bought it partly, and a big part of it was to keep it. It was a historical building from 1852. We wanted to kind of be a caretaker of it. Mm -hmm. There have been some funds to help keep it, uh, keep it up and, and working. Uh, we have. Well, you did work to it, and then you had an open house. We had an open house, mm -hmm. and that was quite successful. It's it is available for people. Uh, we had a wedding there last year. I saw a card. Yes, of, uh, yes. That, that must yeah. be from a couple that got married. Yeah, there. they, they uh, are out of state and uh, they fell in love with the, the quaintness of the church uh -huh. and even though it's not like a perfectly kept church because it's it's old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they, they really enjoyed it. They had their wedding and uh, and we would allow other weddings uh, uh, if people needed other like a funeral or something. We'd open it up. We're not really advertising it outright but it is available for you know I would think um, little music performances would be yeah nice the, we the we our next meeting which is the second Saturday of uh, it'll be August we're having our barbecue over there because mm -hmm. it's out of the way it's quieter and then we'll have our meeting after that and in September we are having a presentation by uh, Peter Stowell who was doing his uh, Western Lost Indian Tribes of Western Maine, oh, wow. which he has done at Greenwood, and he's done it in many different towns in the area, but he is going to be doing it at the church. And when and is that? That is going to be like at our August meeting. It would be like around six or seven o'clock. The time isn't ex exact yet. A but weeknight? The, the, no, it will be a Saturday, the second Saturday of, uh, of August. Okay. Uh, no, September. Okay. Of, of September. Maybe we so. should film that. <laughs> well, we probably don't have to because I filmed the presentation when it was at Greenwood. Oh, okay. So we can just right. sit back and I can just sit back and enjoy this okay. one without working. All right. <laughs> so. Um, wow. So, so when you're here, what do you see the people most interested in? The switchboard. The switchboard. Yeah. And, and pictures. Yeah. And quite often they want to know if you have a picture of like this house because that's where their grandparents lived or that's where their parents lived. Uh -huh. or, um, 
and some people just they just want to see what is here yeah. and uh, and uh, and ask questions like well why is there a village here in Bryan Pond? <laughs> you know, what what made it popular for people to move in here? Wasn't it the last part of the the area that was actually settled? Yes. It, because in something like land was bought and kind of parceled out for family a family or two maybe. And wasn't the Bryant Pond actually the last part that was settled? As far as, well, in the history of Woodstock, um, down in the Stevens Mills, which is on Old County Road, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't know where it is now unless you right. were historically in tune to it. Right, but that's where, you can go all the way down Old County Road and yes. not find anything that seems... Right, there are no houses yeah. from yeah. that era left. Right. But that was the beginning of the town of Woodstock. It was the village of, uh, of Stevens Mills. And then South Woodstock, where they had the, uh, the casket mill mm -hmm. out there, that became a, a settlement. And wasn't that like in Andrews? Andrews Corner. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, up in Pinnock on mm -hmm. the end of Rumford Avenue. So we had like several different places. And this wasn't any much. I mean, there were some people living here. I mean, Christopher Bryant built his house here. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, in the like 1851-52 and afterwards that people started to move to this area, Bryant Pond Village, because the railroad came through. Oh, and okay. the railroad meant transportation. Mm -hmm. It meant jobs. And that's why people even moved houses from uh, Pinhook. They would they dragged them over to uh, oh, wow. just put them in the village of Bryant Pond to be near new jobs and... Like I said, an easy way to get to South Paris or Bethel or Portland or you, wherever you had to go. Do you know specifically, like, any particular houses over there that had been dragged over? Offhand, I don't, but we we find it find yeah, out. Yeah, so that's that's very interesting. So. And I, I I just briefly was looking at some things, and it said something about Sparta. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about Sparta. <laughs> well, in uh, about 1819, when uh, the town of Woodstock, no, this was my town of Woodstock, would have been 1815. So, uh, of course, we were part of Massachusetts at yeah. that time. And I think Maine, I saw the date 1814, and then yeah. that's eight, because I kept thinking 1814, we yeah. took a little trip. <laughs> <laughs> Down the Mississippi to, yeah, okay. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that's, we were part of Massachusetts at that time. And the residents wanted to become a town, and they chose the name of Sparta. And for whatever reason, when the legislature of Massachusetts uh, accepted the uh, our request. Uh, request and whatever, it came back, is, and they named it Woodstock. Isn't that? So, and that's exactly what I saw, that there was really no particular right. reason. And I believe, I, I'm correct, that Lock Mills, in the town of Greenwood, they wanted to be named, I believe it was Athens. Wow. And it came back Greenwood. Wow. So. <laughs> they like wood down there. So wood yeah, I, I, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow, so. that's, that's, see, I find that interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so. there's no really rhyme or reason. That's to right. Why it ended up that that's way. That's right. Someone didn't really want those <laughs> names. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, yes, that's yeah. right. So. So, um, maybe, will we, like, I'm interested in this piano over here in that little building that's still there. Are we going to like try to get up closer to that and see what that is? Well, let's go around and see if you have any questions. Okay. Okay, I was interested in this photograph, so we're going to find a little bit about it. As I've driven through Bryant Pond for many years, I noticed this building. And as you can see, underneath it, it was called the tea room. So I'm going to ask Larry here to tell me a little bit about the tea room because honestly I'm asking him for the second time because, because I just uh, tried to do this and I don't think that I had the camera running. So right here we have a journal and it is a guest book of and it was called The Little Jap Tea Room and it was in Bryant Pond. And so uh, this guest book, I think we figured out it started in 1914? It started in July of 1914. And it was busy. It has a lot of, of names in it. We have 
uh, people came from, from Poland Spring, uh, from East Deering, uh, from Washington, D.C. Wow. Uh, Springfield, Mass. And of course, we have those that came from West Paris and Bryant Pond. Right. <laughs> and that was that was the, on July twenty seventh, nineteen fourteen. And um, and that book goes through it's through nineteen fifteen, and I saw thirty seven, and I think it said nineteen forty one, maybe where it stopped. I think it missed some time, or maybe there was another book uh, as well. There could have been another book. This, this goes to July of nineteen forty one. We are, we have people that in July third came from Norway, Boston, South Portland, Stanford, Connecticut, uh, Merlin, New Hampshire. And this piano came from the tea room. This piano came from the tea room. This was donated by to the society by Anella Burnham. And actually, that's a piano stool was donated by Anella Burnham. I don't know who donated the piano. Uh huh. But it came from the little Jap tea room. And it's been in the museum ever since I can remember. And it's quite large, as it's it said large before. Piano. It's a heavy and the piano. We actually uh, tried to move it once, and we decided we guess we'd leave it right where it was. Does it have a? What kind is this? It's uh, right here, I think. This is right there. George M. Gould and Company of Boston, Massachusetts. Is it Gould or Guild? I think that's Guild. 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 George M. Guild. M. Guild. So it's a big piano, and we have some other instruments sitting there that he said did not come from the tea room, but we believe the tea room provided entertainment, I'm musical sure entertainment, did. and tea, and probably coffee, and um, lunch, and lunch. And it was noted that that Bryant Pond was a dry town, so this was not serving alcohol. It would be. I, I'm pretty sure that probably there was no alcohol involved. Tea. And over here, there is a sign, a nice old sign, from the little Jap tea room. Beautiful antique sign. And then I heard Larry mention that there was another tea room. There was another tea room, which was where, by where the library is now. Uh, there was a little store there. It was, we, as kids, we knew it as Farm Brown store, and right beside it was what was known as the Rainbow Tea Room. And I'm assuming it probably was more or less the same kind of a, a lunch stop, tea room kind of thing. We had and do you think that one was either at the end of, the, was I, it at the I, same I, time as this or afterward? After, after that. that was probably after, probably it was in the 1950s, 1960s. Okay. Because that was, that was the time when people had, after World War II people, had more cars, they, they drove more, and I'm thinking that was probably when that started. Uh huh. And we figured out you weren't old enough to I remember the little Jap T Room. No, 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 no. And like I said, as, as a teenager, I can remember the Rainbow Teen Room. Right, right. Well, thank you very much. So, a few more questions for Larry. Now I see this um, poster, an old poster for the Shepherd family, and it was musical entertainment. And you think that perhaps that was someone that entertained at the opera house? Yep, we had they, we had an opera house here in town, and they had a lot of musical things there. They had a lot of plays. They did almost a probably a monthly play, and we have various different ones that I've seen uh, pictures of that they did. And this opera house is where the post office is now? Yes, it, it, burned, in, it burned in 1926. Okay. So, it, it, so do you know, like, what its heyday was? What? I'm going to say probably the early, early 1920s. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go up here and see if I can... I see way over there, there is an opera house poster. Um, can't quite... The Opera House, Bryant Pond, Friday evening. So there's, there's something happening there. And, and uh, maybe Wayne will get some photographs of some of the other Opera House happenings. Oh, there's another big one. Oh, let me try to get over there. <laughs> opera House One Night, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah, October 2nd. Friday night only. And maybe there's a year over there we can, we can find out. So... Yeah, thanks so much. You've been so interesting. It's been fun talking with you.